section 17.2 in your first of light this uh, video will show you the main idea of this section what is light what is light light is, light is what is light that's a good question isn't it what is light <laughs> isn't it an element is light? um light? Light, light is brightness i guess we have auras we all have auras which are a light yes they are it lights up the room, it makes it not dark. What's the difference between blue light and red light? The colour goes in your eyes and then you see stuff. They range from white to red to orange to green, it's like the chakras of your body. Can you see my aura? Uh, no, not particularly right now. Is it too bright out? It's very sunny out here today. Does that make it harder to see someone's aura? Mm, not necessarily. If I was to explain it to a blind person, <laughs> right? yeah. it would be it would be the difference. Uh, you see nothing whatsoever as a blind person, whereas I see things in front of me. To be fair, the question of what light is is not an easy one. For centuries, the greatest minds in science debated this issue. In the late 1600s, Newton proposed that light was a stream of particles or corpuscles. He proposed this in his treatise Optics. But at the same time, a Dutch physicist named Huygens proposed that light was a wave. And this debate raged on until it was settled by the experiment I've recreated today, Thomas Young's double slit experiment. To make sure I got the experiment right, I went to- There is an empty box. Mm -hmm. And this is a little eyepiece where we can look in, and this is a hole. And I'm gonna place this slide above that hole. And if you look closely, you'll see that there's two openings very yeah. narrow opening side by side. It's a double slit. Now before we have a look, we need to tilt it towards the sun a little bit. So mm -hmm. we want the sun to hit this double slit directly. What are we gonna see on the bottom well, of the box? Well, the obvious thing you think you're gonna see is you're gonna see two, two lines. Two lines on the bottom of the box. Two bright bands. Two little lines. Yeah. I think it'll be... You expected to see kind of one line. Two lines on the bottom of the box. Is that what you see? No. I see dots. How many? It's one circle. Well, there's one, there's one in the middle strongest, two either side. The two on the outside are multicolored, and the one in the middle it's one circle. is just white. Kind of a rainbow? The rainbow colour as well. Yeah, I can see tons of dots now. Not tons, but I can see dots spreading across that way. Yeah, definitely. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, that's incredible. And that's just nothing else apart from two slits. Yeah, that's incredible. And that's just... Is light a wave, or is it made of particles? So what causes that? Well, if light were behaving as particles, you would expect them to go through each slit and just produce a bright spot underneath. So we would see two bright spots on the bottom of the box. But if light's behaving as waves, then the wave from one slit can interact with the waves from the other slit. I've got a demonstration here on a little pond where we can see this with water waves. I have two sources of ripples, which are basically like the two slits. When I create ripples with a single source, they travel out with circular wave fronts. Nothing particularly surprising there. But if I add a second source of ripples, then we start getting an interesting pattern. This pattern is created by the ripples from the two sources interacting with each other. Where they meet up peaks with peaks and troughs with troughs, the amplitude of the wave is increased. That's what we call constructive interference. But if the peak from one wave meets up with the trough from the other, then we get destructive interference and there's basically no wave there. And this is exactly what was happening with the light. When the light from one slit met up peaks with peaks and troughs with troughs, they constructively interfered and produced a bright spot. But if the trough from the wave from one slit met up with the peak of the wave from the other slit, they would destructively interfere and you wouldn't see any light there. It's light cancelling itself out. So it's basically the same as like having two drops of water fall in a swimming pool. That's right. Get exactly the same pattern. They go and overlap. As this ripple over, overlaps with those ripples, yeah. down the bottom, you get a series of, you get like a bright spot, and then a dark spot, and then a bright spot, then a dark spot, then a bright spot. Now there's a slight complication, which is that sunlight is composed 
composed of many different colors, and they have different wavelengths. So obviously they're going to meet up at slightly different points. And that's what caused the rainbowing effects as we go further from the central maximum. You saw the ones to the right were slightly colored. Yeah, that's it's because to the reds are going to meet up at different places than the blues. And that's all that makes the color differences, is different wavelengths. Exactly. That's amazing. So the difference between so the red so and blue... So that red bin over there and the green, the green part, are just, I'm, I'm seeing it's that a different, it's just different, different wavelengths. And that's how we bring in all these beautiful colors all around us. That's amazing. I'm, I'm amazed. Oh, good on you. Thanks, Ben. Hey, thank you. I have been enlightened, literally. Thank you. I have been enlightened. Well, that's uh, the main idea. And it is uh, an extension of um, what we saw before. Before we saw um, diffraction by a single slit, that if this is, uh, we were talking about uh, having uh, some, sort of, some sort of an obstacle here and uh, another obstacle letting the weight go through and on the edges it would bend and giving, um, creating a shadow on the one side and somewhere there, uh, a region where there would be some uh, light going into the shadows. Well, this effect, it is um, diffraction. And, um, but uh, when we have two of those, then the situation gets uh, more interesting because we have now one slit producing a wave and the other slit producing the other wave and these two waves are interfering with one another as we saw in the video. And that uh, if we have um, um, a screen far away and the screen um, is illuminated by this uh, pattern of waves, then we're gonna see a very bright central maximum brightness, and then a dark, and then a bright and dark, and so on. It becomes kind of uh, less intense as if we move to the sides. And this is the so-called young double slit experiment that proved that indeed, uh, light is a wave, behaves as a wave, and uh, this of course was not, uh, was against uh, Newton's corpuscular theory, and he fought it all of his life with all of his power. Um, um, Huygens, who came up with this idea, was not able to take credit or advance his theory because of the interference of, uh, of Newton, who was a, you know, a dictator in terms of uh, as the Royal Academy. This is a, a side view. We have the wave coming in. These lines are the wave fronts and uh, an opening chops the, uh, the wave and it, whatever comes here produces a spherical wave that here we see as a circular wave and uh, these two interfere and depending, they're going to go and illuminate the screen, which is here shown sideways. If we turn it around, it would look like this. And um, what happens is that uh, one wave has to travel less distance than the other wave. And depending on the relative and the difference on these uh, travel paths, the um, illumination here is going to be maximum or minimum, depending on, on whether the difference here is... Uh, allows for constructive or destructive interference. For destructive interference, you want the, di the difference between this distance and that distance, this one, to be equal to um, half a wavelength, or one and a half wavelengths, or two and a half wavelengths. And the uh, half me um, is necessary to have one travel a complete number of wavelengths, whereas the other one is going to travel uh, the same number plus a, a half, so that when one is at a maximum, the other one is at a min minimum, and the two waves cancel, producing a dark band. These uh, are known as the um, interference fringes, and because this point here is the central point, is closer to the sources than, say, this one, this is going to be brighter than this one. So the intensity increases, um, decreases from the central and both to the right or to, and to the left. 
mathematically speaking, what we what we have is that the distance between these two, uh, call it delta r, r1 minus r2, or vice versa, is going to be equal to, for constructive interference, it's going to be equal to an integer number of wavelengths. So if m equals zero, then the, this, the difference is zero, and that means that these, these two paths are equal to each other, and we're talking about the central uh, fringe. If um, the difference is equal to, if, if m equals one, then the difference equals to one wavelength. That means that this one, the difference between this one and this one is gonna be one wavelength. The difference is this tiny bit here. And this tiny bit is gonna be one wavelength. If they are, if this one is ahead, if this one is ahead of this one by one wavelength, that means that when they reach the screen, they are gonna be in phase um, crest to crest and throat to throat and with that they will be giving you another maximum which is uh, what we call constructive interference so in general um, the bright fringes are going to be given by this which this, this is the location the the distance from the center is the y the y um, in the y direction is going to be given by m lambda times the length how far the screen is divided by d which is the distance between these two those two um, slits the openings now if we want to calculate the location of the dark fringes and we're talking about these fringes now then we have to do exactly the same as before but add one half to the count of uh, wavelengths. They are in between the bright fringes. In terms of the intensity, as I mentioned before, the central one is the most intensive. We plot intensity this way. If this represents the intensity, then it's going to be maximum intensity and then it's going to be decreasing in intensity as it moves away. Only because, you know, this, uh, this part of the screen is farther away from the slits than the central part. Okay, to put your um, these ideas to the test, um, a lab experiment produced a double slit uh, interference pa pattern on the screen. The point on the screen, this point here, marked with a dot, is how much farther from the left slit than from the right slit. This is the central maximum. So this point is how much farther from the from the one of the slits than with respect to the other slit. Is it one wavelength away, two wavelengths, etc. So at this point, pause, think, and answer. It is two, as we can see. If this is the central one, then this is this one is one wavelength. Is traveling one wavelength more through one slit than through the other one, and this one is traveling two wavelengths more in distance from one slit than to the next one. Next, a uh, lab experiment produces this uh, interference pa pattern. If the screen is moved farther away from the slits, the fringes will be closer in the same position, farther apart, etc. etc. So please pause think and answer. Well, farther apart, because remember that um, the location of the fringes goes like uh, pro proportional to L. So if L increases, this increases. So they are going to be separated. Next, on the same screen, uh, this was produced with red light. Uh, if green light is used, what happens to the fringes? Now, green light has a smaller wavelength, higher energy, smaller wavelength, higher frequency. So, based on that, pause, think, and answer. Closer together, because uh, lambda is the wavelength, the, the separation, between the two, between the adjacent fringes is given by proportional to lambda. If lambda shrinks, if, if it gets smaller, this will get smaller and the fringes will get closer together. 
another one. Now, um, in this case, we're moving the slits closer together. We're changing the D. What happens when the D gets smaller in terms of um, the fringes? Pause. Plane can answer. Well, they will get separated because um, the se separation between adjacent fringes go is proportional to the inverse of the distance. So if this decreases, this one will increase. In this example, we have a pattern that, um, that is uh, observed on the screen that is one meter away. This, is, this would be L. The, um, the two slits are separated by 0 0.3 millimeters, and we, that would be D. Um, from the center of one fringe to the center of the ninth fringe, we are told that the distance is 1.6 centimeters. The question is, what is the wavelength of uh, the light? Well, I'll give you time to think about it. You can pause here and try to write the proper expressions on, the, on a piece of paper and solve for the wavelength from there, and then come back and test this. Okay, I hope you did that. Let's uh, look at the answer. Well, we're told that um, solving for the wavelength from the, the expression for the separation between fringes is given by this. In this case, uh, this would be the separation between two adjacent fringes, but uh, we don't have that. We have the separation between nine adjacent fringes, consecutive fringes. So. If we divide um, the distance by 9, we get the separation between adjacent fringes. We plug it here and we solve for the wavelength. And it turns out to be 530 nanometers. And it says here that you know, we should be using nanometers because everybody else is using, it, using them. Another example, and this one you can try on your own, you, you take a piece of uh, aluminum foil, and then just make two tiny cuts about one uh, millimeter apart and go outside and look at um, uh, a street light in the night and you're gonna see you know blurry things like this but basically uh, that's uh, an interference pattern another example in this case we have uh, the separation between the slits is 0 0.04 millimeters and they are being illuminated by a laser, helium neon laser, that has a wavelength of 633 nanometers. And they are, we're being asked, what is the angle of the first fringe? And for that, we're going to have to remember how to calculate angles. So it's going to be the tangent of this angle is going to be this distance divided by this distance. So it's um, another straight application of the previous expression. We have um, that y, the location of the first fringe, is given by this, and the l is going to be get cancelled, so it's going to be just simply m wavelength divided by the distance. And once you have that number, you hit your uh, inverse tangent, and you get 0 0.9 degrees. Very small, very small angle, less than one degree. The second question is. What is the angle of the 30th fringe? And, you know, you just replace M by, instead of 1, use 30 and do the same thing again. This is it for section 17.2, uh, and this is uh, the homework, a bunch of problems to, for you to practice. And that's it.